Welcome to the Barry Trammell Show. In the 1980s, Scott Hill was Barry Switzer's ace recruiter and brought in some of the great talent that made the 1980s a glorious time for Sooner football. In the winter of 1985, Scott Hill allowed me to tour the country with him on a week in which we traveled the nation talking to some of the best recruits. It's a fantastic story. People can't believe it today, but it indeed happened. And Scott Hill joins us today as we reminisce about that memorable week on the road. But first, I want to thank our sponsors, Next Generation Mo- Roofing, Two Fellas Moving, Weedman Lawn Service, FireLakesJob.com, Oklahoma's Ford Dealers, Oklahoma's 988 Helpline. When it comes to two fellas moving, guys, most people aren't like me. I don't mind helping people move. Most people do. That's where two fellas comes in. It's a no string. It's a uh, it's a company with free, no strings attack, attached quotes. They pretty much moved it all. Their services don't end at moving. They will help you with remodeling or spring cleanup, covered with dumpster rentals and junk haul services. Remember, quotes are free, and there are no strings attached. If you're moving in Oklahoma, make sure to call the fellas. Visit twofellas.com for your free quote today. And now we bring in Scott Hill. I've been looking forward to this. This is going to be fun talking about old times, and uh, thanks for joining us today. Well, I'm looking at me on this camera, looking at you on this camera, and the one thing you have said that makes a lot of sense is uh, old times. So uh, I'm looking forward to it myself. Yeah, you know, I've I've told people over the years about the trip you allowed me to take with you. What's now coming coming upon 39 years ago? What uh, whatever got into you to let uh, to allow me to tag along and watch you recruit six or seven of your prized prospects of 1985? Well, you know, Barry, let me say this first, uh, and then I'll comment, but if my memory serves me correctly, we signed six or, or five of those six or seven, so I should have had you do it every year. It would have made more <laughs> sense. But, I, I, you know, Barry, back then, uh, you and a lot of the different uh, radio guys and newspaper guys were all, you know, we were more friends than I think they probably are now, and it made sense because it helped us. We were able to ask questions of you all. You all got a hold of the players. And sometimes uh, we were able to get answers from you all after you all talked to the players that we couldn't get. And it actually uh, helped us in our strategies in the recruiting process. So that was part of it. And, and then I just think the relationships were different back then than they are now. Uh, uh, I hope so. But uh you know, wasn't any really prompting. I remember the only thing I had to do, I just had to go in to Coach Switzer and say, Coach, you know, I've got this idea and we've talked to Barry about it and we think it'd be fun and I think the players would like it. you mind if I call them and he makes the trip with me? He said, nope, not if you think it'll help. And obviously it did. You know, well, here's what's funny, Scott. I actually called Stoops this week, Bob Stoops, and said, I'm going to tell you a story you won't believe. And uh, he found it fairly fascinating but he also said he said you know what i can see the benefit in that that's something i might should have considered when i was coaching and maybe brent ought to ought to try it too so uh maybe we'll bring it back but i'm gonna i'm gonna outline quickly the uh our itinerary for that week we left on a monday afternoon and flew to dallas and you visited mark white a running back and lonnie finch a defensive back back in, in dfw the next morning, we got up and flew to Indianapolis, vi- uh, visited Kenny McMitchell in Indy, got up on Wednesday morning, flew to Newark, New Jersey, and visited um, Kenny Sally, who yeah. was the only guy on this trip who didn't end up signing with the Sooners, got up on Thursday morning, flew cross-country to Seattle, had lunch on the water in Seattle, and then went and saw Scott Thompson, a safety from suburban Seattle then jumped on a plane and flew to Los Angeles and had a late night dinner with Jamel Holloway, came home Friday morning. Uh, I was worn out, but it was just an eye-opening experience. And what are your, what are your re- original, uh, when, when I called you the other day, what were your just quick memories of that trip? You know, I think there was a little bit of an apprehension about it, about how uh, parents might take it in in-home visits or if we happen to run into them. But more than anything, Else, I think the thing, and one of you, we, you talk about this uh, with Kenny Sally, 
is how would the coaches approach that with this uh, taking place? I wasn't worried about the players because I was in contact with the players, you know, at least once uh, every every other day, and usually every day by that time of uh, the recruiting process. So I knew they were going to be okay with it. But, you know, just a little bit of an apprehension about going into the high schools, whichever ones we went into and what the coaches might think. Uh, uh, it was a new thing. There wasn't any other uh, uh, recruiters out there doing the same thing. So it was I'm going to call it innovative now because six out of seven makes it innovative. If it had been one out of seven, we probably <laughs> wouldn't be having this conversation. But I, I think just a little bit of the apprehension uh, uh, more than anything else. I, I wasn't concerned about it because of our relationship, you know, as far as being able to enjoy each other on the trip. But, uh, you, know, you know, you never know how high school coaches uh, might uh, accept or, or not accept something like that. Yeah, you know, what? The uh, it was a smooth it was a smooth trip in terms of um, connecting with the players, the prospects. The only thing was in Newark, you got a you got a stunning surprise. You were expecting Kenny Sally to sign with the Sooners, and we get there, and the coach, uh, whose name escapes me all these years later, but he sort of had a, a stark message. He said, uh, "Kenny's going to go to South Carolina." He told you, "I don't know Barry Switzer. I don't know if he would take care of Kenny Sally." I know Joe Morrison down at South Carolina. I can trust him. I'm going to send Kenny Sally to uh, South Carolina. You brought he brought Kenny Sally in. Kenny Sally seemed very uh, uh, I don't know depressed is the wrong word, but a little sullen. He wasn't the least bit outgoing. You could tell this was troubling him. Maybe he just didn't like telling you no, but. You uh, you chatted with him for a little bit, and he just you know just didn't really have much to say. We went to his mother's house. The only time on this entire trip that I wasn't with you was when you went into Kenny Sally's house for about five minutes just to figure out what's going on. He you said I better they don't know you're here. They don't know anything about this. I better I better uh, go uh, alone. Came back five minutes later and just sort of shrugged and said I, I don't know what happened. So that was the only downer to the uh, to the entire trip did, did you did you generally have a pretty good batting average on a trip like that uh, getting five or six out of seven oh you know back then uh, Barry when we recruited nationally it's a little bit differently different than it is now typically when we recruited on a national basis then uh, we had a lot of more success and the reason was because we recruited the uh, positions that we needed so in order to go out then, back then it was a little bit earlier in the freshman recruiting process, but to be able to and kind of give those uh, coaches and players more so, and certainly parents sometime, the uh, idea that the, the players that we were recruiting on a national basis had an opportunity to come in and play early. I think that was a big, a big part of the recruiting for those players from our perspective and then from their perspective, knowing that we had a, a real – real need at their specific position that we wouldn't be recruiting them from that far away. We were, you know, had all the player, players, so many players in Texas surrounding area. I think that helped us a lot. So I'm going to answer the question. Yes, it, it didn't always work out that way, obviously, but uh, uh, I think that we went in with a decided advantage, certainly because of the need we had on the players that we were recruiting uh to Oklahoma at that time. We were just, we just need, I, I'm always go back to Stanley Wilson. That kind of started everything. And we knew if Stanley Wilson came in, we had a really good idea that he was having an opportunity to start as freshman. And sure enough, he did. And then from then on, it kind of just worked its way. And, and by the, by the time we were recruiting all those guys, we had a really good feel for it. You reminded me of something the other day when we were chatting is, is that, that basic uh, tour that we took, um, whether it was, you know, Dallas, Indy, Newark, Seattle, LA, back to Oklahoma City. Um, some form of that trip, you took five, six, seven times that winter leading up to signing day. Sometimes you went in a different order, but basically for several weeks in a row, you were flying all over the country day after day after day. And for clarification, we were not flying private. We were all, that was all commercial. <laughs> so uh, my question is, I mean, I was completely worn out. I was 24 years old at the time. I was worn out. How about you? Did, did that wear on you, or how were you able to physically and mentally sort of hold up, uh, sort of hold up during that kind of intensive travel schedule? Yeah, a very good question. I, I think I would probably answer that question a little bit differently now if I were to put myself in that position. But back then, uh, with uh, I'm going to I'm going to call it adrenaline. 
because that's what it was. I mean, I always felt you know, confident. Uh, number one, I had a great uh, uh, the University of Oklahoma was an easy sell. We had a lot of good things going for us at that time, so it was easy to get indoors. Generally, coaches uh, liked us, so all of those things kind of fit into place. And as you found out in California, I typically had a, a, an alumni that I was able to get to know in most of those areas and sometimes met guys like Jay, we'll probably talk about in a minute. But, uh, you know, I generally had somebody that would pick me up at the airport. I got to know, got to uh, develop good relationships with. So from that perspective, it, it helped. And, and Barry, just in all honesty, I was younger and that was my job. I mean, I was a, a decent X and O's guy, but I was a good recruiter. And I, I think that was where my confidence was. And I think that's what uh, where Coach Switzer, you know, what he saw in me early on to hire me right out of out of college is that I got along with everybody and, and uh, presented myself pretty well and certainly was pretty good at presenting the University of Oklahoma. So my confidence level, the success that I had early with Stanley and Jamel and that that a particular group of guys we brought in that year and then just continued to uh, work that way. It's a lot easier when you have a good product to sell and it's a lot easier when you're younger. And uh, uh, so I, I didn't have any kids, so that helped too. I know that I, my wife sometimes didn't didn't uh, like me being gone that time, that much time each week. She understood it six or seven weeks out of the year. That was just my job. And I think that's what we did. And, and I was happy to do it because of the success. I'm going to throw a few memories from that trip at you and, and, and get your response and also maybe some perspective on how things have changed. Um, we, we met with, I don't know, three or four sets of parents. Lonnie Finch's mother, I've always remembered, because you weren't there selling, uh, selling OU to her. She was there to interrogate you, and she put you on the witness stand, and she had question after question after question for you. Uh, and, of course, Lonnie Finch signed with the Sooners, ended up playing quite a bit for the Sooners, had a solid career. But I remember just her involvement and her sort of awareness of, of what this was all about was striking, and other parents not as much. And my question is, how rare was it for a parent to be that in tune with exactly what she needed to be asking? And how do you think it's changed? Do parents have more information now? Um, what, what's your general impression of when I remind you of Lonnie Finch's mother? Well, I, I think the key word is mother. So uh, a lot, lot of mothers were a lot uh, more inclined to get involved with those uh, those uh, little intricate things that took place on campus and how their boy was going to be taken care of. I think, uh, you know, I'm going to go back to the head coach. I mean, the mama, for, uh, Kenny Sally's mama, you know, that she just trusted the high school head coach when he told her that Joe Morrison was going to take care of Kenny Sally and his comment to us was, you know, I just don't know that Barry Switzer would take care of Kenny Sally. Uh, so a lot of the times it, it, it wasn't, uh, oh, I'm not in a, a high percentage, but I'd say there was 50% uh, of the time that uh, I would have uh, those type conversations with mothers. Dads and I hit it, pro hit it off probably on a little bit different level. But uh, I would say it's uh, probably 50-50 that mamas sat me down one-on-one -on -one and, and, you know, they wanted me to promise. And, you know, guarantee is the word I think that came out of their mouth sometimes. Obviously, I couldn't do that, but uh, they just wanted to make sure that their son was uh, going to be taken care of. I think what taken care of means this day and time in opposed to what taken care of meant back then is totally different. What it meant back then was, you know, if we have some sort of family problem that comes up uh, immediately, are you going to be able to get them home? Are you going to be able to help us get them home in case something happens to a family member? Whereas this day and time, I think uh, the total perspective is different with uh, what it means to, to take care of them. I mean, you know, you, Jay used to pick us up in a limo and take us to school, take us to those schools now these kids can buy their own limo. So being taken care of is just a little bit different than it was back then. I think it was more of the personal relationship I was going to have with the player and the personal relationship that I was going to be able to maintain with the parents made a big difference to them. We went to, uh, we went to Indianapolis and um, visited the, the Kenny McMitchell family. Lots of, uh, lots of family there. Kenny seemed solidly in the OU camp. Uh, was that just a case of, and this was the same, I think, with Scott Thompson in Seattle, although we just saw Scott at his school. We didn't go to his home. 
Was was this a case of these guys were solid Sooners? You felt great about them, but you just felt the need to to connect it weekly and 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 make sure that they were they were committed to Oklahoma. Yeah, I think the the committing weekly was uh, more of a uh, it was more of a process that all the coaches tried to go through and. Back then, you know, we carried that big old boot for a phone. We didn't have, uh, you know, uh, flip phones or iPhones like we've got now and had to memor- remem- memorize all of the phone numbers. Uh, I think a couple of things in answer to your question. I, I think, number one, uh, as I said earlier on, when you were coaching at the University of Oklahoma in the late 70s and 80s, uh, we played on TV the maximum t- times every year. We were winning. We went to the Orange Bowl at least every other year, 11 times, I think, while I was there. And so the the exposure that we were getting from a national perspective made a lot of difference, uh, kind of like Alabama, I think, would be or Georgia would be right now walking into a home. Uh, we had that type of exposure back then. So to some degree, the kids were excited about uh, Oklahoma in and of itself, much less the football part of it. And uh, by, because they just watched us on TV because we won so much. It's, it's a heck of an advantage to have that product, to uh, be able to walk in. And I mean, I, I always knew when I walked into a Kenny Sally or a Kenny McMitchell's home or a- anybody who's out of town, if I could ask them uh, who our starters were at that their particular position, if I could ask them early on and they knew, I knew right then I had an opportunity. And, uh, you know, I, I'm going to use Jamel Holloway as an example. He knew our quarterback was graduating, and we and he knew exactly what the situation was. When the first time I ever talked to him, I knew we had an opportunity with him because he knew about the University of Oklahoma and, and uh, who was graduating, what his opportunity would be. And I think uh, that was one of the early tests that I went through with the players, just in asking them questions, trying to discern, how much do you really know about the University of Oklahoma? And I got a pretty good picture out of the first couple of conversations, what they knew and what they didn't about us. When uh, I think of Kenny McMitchell and Jamel Holloway and the dichotomy between the two and the difference, you know, um, the difference between living in Indy and living in California and uh, <laughs> the difference in lives they had lived, uh, you know, Jamel, when he was quarterback in the 85 Sooners to the national championship, he was pretty street smart. He was pretty street wise. Not all these guys were being recruited as high school seniors. How'd you have to deal with different personalities? Uh, somebody who was clearly, you know, had seen a lot in life, um, like Jamel Holloway, whereas, you know, Kenny McMitchell had come from a pretty structured home and was, you know, not, not a guy uh, who had, uh, uh, seen a lot of the world. How, how'd you, how'd you handle that diverse of personalities and experiences? You know, Barry, a, a couple answers on that. I think the first answer is that, uh, I probably wasn't. No, I'm, I'm going I'm to take that. I was not very good at it uh, early on in, my, in the rep- recruiting process. I mean, I'm talking about my first couple of years in recruiting. That's something that's learned. It's not something that you just just have. And then over time, I think as the players come to come to your campus, sign with you, and come to campus, you learn uh, again what Mama meant about uh, you know what we needed to do to take care of them. And a lot of that was to make sure that they called their mama on Sundays every Sunday or whatever those things might do, and to be able to uh, encourage them to do that. Uh, and then the second part of the answer to that question is, you know, I, again, I got better at uh, knowing the players, getting to know what kind of I, – I knew, used a good example, Kenny and Mick Mitchell was from a great family, had a great family. And Jamel was too, but, but Jamel was a loner. He was going to be his own guy, and so we were going to have to handle him a little bit differently. And then once they got the – to campus, it also changed a little bit. If they were running first of a second or third team after the second practice, you know, I knew they were going to be a little bit different with taken care of too than those guys that, uh, you know, were struggling to make, maybe make the football team. That's another piece of it there. Once they got to campus, it completely changed with some. You had to manage that. It was difficult to recruit a player to come to the University of Oklahoma and six months into the process, you know, they're not even on the depth chart. That's a difficult thing for them to to handle. And so you managed uh, that situation a whole lot different than you did the guy that walked in on campus, Marcus Dupree, so to speak, that you know, we knew he was going to, he and Keith Jackson's guys like that, they were going to start the first day we lined up and played. And uh, so you, you kind of uh, measured that, evaluated that, managed it differently. I And again, the third part of that answer is, 
I got much, much better uh, later on with communicating with myself, communi communicating with the parents once or twice, maybe even three times a month, depending on what was going on with the player. Because if I saw a player down in the in the dressing room, then I made a point to visit with him and then go call the, par the parents and visit with them too. And again, I think that goes back to a little bit of experience and that's what mamas want. They want to know what's going on. They don't necessarily want their son to start, but they do want to know when he's down, when he's out, and when he's having a good time. You, uh, I, th I thought of of you the other day when, when we were talking about Kenny Sally. I, I compared you to NFL cornerbacks and major league pitchers. You got to have short memories. You go, uh, we go to Morristown, New Jersey. We go see Kenny Sally. You think he's solidly in the Sooner camp, and then all of a sudden, bang, the door is shut. Um, we, when, you, when you lose a guy like that, and Kenny Sally was clearly a great prospect. If I remember right, he was a parade All-American. He had a good career at South Carolina. He had been a great Sooner. When you lose a guy like that, how difficult is it to put it behind you? Do you do, does it wear on you? Are you were, were you able to just forget about it and go on to, to the next guy on the list? You know, uh, Barry, it's kind of like uh, your competitive nature is what it is. All of us have uh, different levels of uh, competitive nature. Mine just happens to be really, really high, still is, to uh, go out and, and play golf even today. You know, I want to win every hole and make every shot. So I think there's a disappointment. Uh, and, uh, you, you know, it's it's kind of like uh, you, you get close to these guys, and once you get close to them, particularly that trip, my memory serves me correctly, it was later on in the recruiting process, and, you know, I was counting on Kenny Sally to come to University of Oklahoma, and when we got up uh, every Sunday and we went over the board, uh, and I was very confident that but based on my relationship, what he told me and, my, and uh, our visit, because Switzer, my visit we had up there, there wasn't any doubt in my mind that he was going to come to the University of Oklahoma. So he was uh, a disappointing uh, piece of that and certainly was personally it was disappointing. But I th also think it was disappointing because we were counting on, on him to come to the University of Oklahoma. And uh, I am sure, I don't remember uh, right now, but I'm sure there are other players that we probably turned down because his name kept on coming up at the top of the board during the course of the uh, year. And and I, I'm sure that there were other players that we could have picked up that could have come in and helped us. But because of what happened with uh, the Kenny Salad deal, it hurt us as a football team as well. A couple of personal uh, observations here that, that crazy Thursday when I woke up in Newark, New Jersey, and uh, went to sleep in Los Angeles, California, and in between, I had lunch on the pier in Seattle. Um, <laughs> for lunch, I remember for the first, last, and only time in my life I've ever eaten shark, I had a piece of shark for lunch that day <laughs> in Seattle. And that night, with Jay Thomas and Jamel Holloway, we had lobster. Uh, first time I'd ever eaten lobster, hadn't been the last, but um, did uh, guys like Jay Thomas uh, and and there were other boosters that uh, that you mentioned that uh, sort of uh, helped the recruiting process along? Uh, how instrumental were those guys? And did you have to worry about them? Um, what they might do when uh, when you're back in Oklahoma and they stay in a relationship with a Jamel Holloway? Uh, the can answer to that is absolutely. You had to stay on top of that all the time, particularly back then. It was a little, a little bit different. Uh, uh, most of the time, though, I'll, I'll be honest, most of the time, uh, the time that I spent with those type boosters, the uh, Jays, the John Cooperstein's up in New Jersey, the, the reason I spent a lot of time with them, I, I got to know them, I got to become friends, obviously, but they were the outlet or the conduit, so to speak, to helping to get, get those guys summer jobs. And uh, to have, you know, a, a Jay Thomas out in California that had so many different connections in so many different places, you know, all I had to do was call him. I mean, you remember the, the he got me with the president of a Mattel toy company. And, and then from then on, you know, we had jobs at Mattel toys. That was a heck of a job at the factory of Mattel toys. And, and so just to be able to develop those relationships, because back then, uh, obviously we, we, we get in trouble for giving them shoes. You remember we got in trouble for giving Hartley Dyke a pair of shoes and, and, on, and went on probation for some of those little things like that. Uh, so getting them good summer jobs was a big deal. So I think that was the main thing that, uh, that was our ploy as recruiters to, uh, 
you know, encourage them to do that. But did we have to worry about it? I don't know that I ever took a night's sleep that I didn't worry about what Jay Thomas was going to be with, do with Jamel Holloway. <laughs> <laughs> oh, how much, how much pride and satisfaction? I mean, you, you weren't just a recruiter. You most of the time uh, in the eighties, you were coaching running backs and, you know, involved in the day-to-day operation of OU football. So, I mean, you're a mainstream Oklahoma football coach and uh, great victories, great rivalries, great wins throughout that decade. But how much pride did you take when one of the, your guys that you that you actually connected with and brought in, a Jamel Holloway, had the success he did, you know, beating Penn State in the Orange Bowl as a true freshman quarterback, uh, a monumental achievement that that stood the test of time in college football. How much personal pride did you take in knowing, in knowing hey, I was involved with this guy back when he was at when he was at Banning High School. Uh, Barry, let me answer it this way, I, and this is uh, this will be easier for everybody to understand. You know, when you're uh, had been a football player at the University of Oklahoma, like I was able to do, and then you were hired on the staff uh, to coach at, at a very early age. And after your second year of uh, being on the staff, you were put in charge of of something uh, like me being put in char- being put in charge of the uh, recruiting process. That's a, a huge step up, it, and it, it's a national thing. Once somebody that young gets that type of opportunity at a place like the University of Oklahoma, all of a sudden your name goes out on the wires. Uh, you know, mo- most guys do it with uh, defense coordinators, offense coordinators. They're much more uh, uh, known, quicker for things like that. But with me kind of starting the national recruiting process, and uh, then I-, I gained a lot of uh, notoriety, so to speak, throughout the, throughout the country because of, of uh, my success. But the the biggest thing that you always looked for, particularly as a young guy, older, it's not so big a deal. But when, when Coach Switzer calls you in at the end of the recruiting re- year and sets you down one-on-one, and uh, number one, probably gives you a little bonus, but number two says, you know, you, you, you're you making a difference in this football team. And then the next year when Jamel Holloway, for instance, good example, he comes in and we win the national championship. Coach Switzer uh, gets me in and talks to me one-on-one and says, you know, you, you made the biggest difference in this football team that uh, could have been made by bringing Jamel Holloway. You know, we got Kevin Mitchell in that same year, and Kevin was uh, uh, Eric. I mean, Eric Mitchell was much more talented physically than than Jamel was, but Jamel was a ready-made product, and I that's what I told the staff when during the recruiting process. And so I think that's where you get your your biggest uh, ump, so to speak, is when the head coach calls you in and says, you know what you made a difference in this football team this year. It just so happens, uh, you know, we won the national championship and I recruited the court, uh, the uh, quarterback that got us there. So uh, it's a big deal. I, I, I don't know that there's many things in life that uh, uh, give you that type of, again, adrenaline rush that uh, the head coach called you and telling you did a good job. The, he, when he calls you in with the offensive defensive coordinator, you know, something's either really good or it's really bad. <laughs> good. You've been out of the business a long time, over 30 years, Scott. Do you miss it? Do you miss the recruiting, those trips? Uh, the connections are great, but, it, you know, it, there's a price to pay for it. How much do you miss the recruiting aspect? I, Barry, I, I, I don't think there's any way for me to describe uh, how much I miss it. I was uh, made and built to, to be a, a football coach, and I messed it up, as you know, as we all know. And uh, it, it just didn't turn out for me. So I, I miss it a lot. I've been in, involved, as you know, with the University of Oklahoma ever since uh, I left and uh, will always be. I, I tell everybody I was Texas born, Texas bred. When I die, I'll be Oklahoma bred. Well, you when when you look at when you look at this long career and aside, uh, you youngsters who uh, follow Oklahoma football and think you go back a ways. If you've seen the clip of a guy flying through the air and taking out Tony Dorsett in one of the biggest hits of all time, that's him right there. That's him on your screen, Scott Hill, 1975 safety. Um, so your, your career with the Sooners goes back to 1972. Uh, you know, I, I, was, I was laughing the other day when we had all the, all the uh, talk about the, the microphones in, in quarterbacks' helmets. 
to call in the plays and the Michigan uh, scouting scandal over stealing signs. And here's how OU in 1972 got plays into the game. Scott Hill would be standing on the sideline and Galen Hall or Barry Switzer, or I guess in 72 had been Switzer, is telling him, uh, here's the play. Scott Hill would run out onto the field, tell, go into the huddle and tell the quarterback what play and then run right back off. <laughs> so it was, the, I mean, it's just some crazy times, but the you've mentioned this, your affinity for OU football and your, your connection with OU football. Um, and then, like you said, things things went sideways at one point on in in your career and your personal life, and you know you've got all that behind you, doing well now. But why did you stay in Oklahoma? Why did you stay connected with the Sooners? You know, today here you you got an OU hat on. Why why did you decide to stay and say, hey, I'm a, I'm a Sooner forever? Uh, interesting, quick story. Uh, after all that went down, uh, Lee Allen Smith called me in uh, to his office, asked me to come up and visit with him. And he said, uh, the greatest thing that you can do is to go right back out there, stick your head in the middle of everybody here in, in Oklahoma and uh, make something of yourself. And he said, if you're, uh, you're willing to do that, he said, I've seen it happen before, Scott. If you can, if you can do that, then uh, 30, 39 years from now, you'll, you'll be glad. And he, he said, uh, the people in and around the program will be, will be glad and you'll make a whole lot more of yourself there than uh, you would if you tuck tail and, and run. I think uh, Lee Allen visiting with me and then, uh, as you know, my spiritual uh, life uh, really came alive back then. So being able to continue with the Fellowship of Christian Athletes and now with Bible Study Fellowship and just the different path that my life took from a spiritual perspective has uh, has made it all worthwhile. Let's put it that way. How much, uh, how much do you stay connected with the, the modern Sooners? Um, I, I know you're a fan. I know you go to games. I know you cheer on the Sooners. How, how much uh, are you able to connect with, uh, with the current Sooners? You know, there, uh, once Cal Gundy left, he was kind of my connection down there that was uh, there, at least, you know, that I, I knew him a little bit and was able to stay uh, in tuned. Uh, there's not really a, a coach down there now that I have a, a personal relationship with. Most of my, uh, most of it's, I, you know, we have a suite with uh, Larry Labar that we've had for ever since the suites opened. And, and we've got 25 or 30 guys, girls that come uh, to the suite every, every game and have had that for years. And then I, I think the biggest connection, though, is, is through Sooners Helping Sooners. Uh, I was able to, uh, if you'll remember, you know, we started the Wayman Tisdale Freshman Player of the Year Award. I was the original guy that started that award and uh, we used to have the golf tournament out at Gallardia and then uh, I went to coach Switzer one day and said you know coach this this golf tournament's starting to be a pretty good deal we're raising some pretty good money we we need to put that it was a year after Sooners Helping Sooners started so uh, I said we need to move this and call it the Barry Switzer uh, uh, golf uh, tournament and move it somewhere else so he got with Jerry Pettibone and Jay O'Neill and we moved it over there and started the Barry Switzer Golf Classic, and uh, we've we've raised a lot of money over the years for uh, for kids that uh, you know got got themselves in a bad ways, whatever it might be, for Sooners helping Sooners. So that's probably my uh, where I stay most connected. I was very connected originally. Uh, now I you know I'm kind of on the outside. I still play golf, but I'm not as active as I was with helping them raise money and so forth. But that's kind of where I, I spend more of my time than any, anywhere else, just being a great fan and uh, obviously having opportunities like this. You know, I've got I, I do work with James Hale uh, uh, as well. So still on the radio, you know, once a week and uh, doing things like this with you. And, and uh, you know, I've got one point four million hits on the Tony Dorsett hit. Uh, so, you know, I guess I'm still around to some degree. <laughs> well, well, that's fantastic. Well, Scott, I can I can uh, salute you on a glorious OU career from from the hard hitting safety to the great recruiter to the to the on field contributions. You've uh, you'll be forever a, a major part of Oklahoma football. And on a personal side, I don't know that I've ever thanked you enough for that trip uh, thirty. 39 years ago, it was certainly eye-opening for a, a green reporter, 24 years old. Didn't deserve that kind of chance, but I certainly am grateful uh, that you gave it to me, and I've never forgotten it. Well, Barry, the same goes with you. You know, I'm sure there's not a lot of coaches that have had uh, 
coaches and players that uh, 39, 40 years later are visiting with uh, uh, one of the guys that uh, was on uh, uh, the staff of the Norman Transcript either. We, we still got a relationship, and I appreciate that too. And, you know, we'll do it again. If I can sign six out of seven, I just got to figure out some other way to get out there and get it done. <laughs> <laughs> That's great. Well, thanks, Scott. It's, this has been a lot of fun. I appreciate it. Hey, thanks for joining us on the Barry Trammell Show. And if you uh, need, want to find us even more, selloutcrowd.com is the place. To find more of these uh, shows, go to Spotify, Amazon Music, uh, Apple Podcasts, wherever you get your podcasts. Go there and subscribe, subscribe, subscribe. We will talk to you next week. <laughs>